I call him George or Frank or various other things. <laughs> Allison from, from the Department of English and Latin American Latino Studies. And before we begin, I want to make a couple of announcements about upcoming events here at the Institute. Our next fellows lecture will be on December 2nd, and Borke um, Osterk will be, who is our dissertation fellow, one of our dissertation fellows um, from the Department of Philosophy, will speak on how to defend society against science and science against society. So I urge you all to come for that. And on Monday, this coming Monday, November 18th at 3 o'clock, we'll have um, one of the speakers in our series, um, New Research in Food Studies. Um, then that will be Angela Jill Cooley, who will be speaking on Let Them Eat Politics, Food Power, and Poverty in the Civil Rights Era. And that should be quite interesting as well. Um, looking forward to the spring term, we have quite a lot on our agenda for the spring, including fellows lectures. We'll have a visiting fellow, uh, Richard White from Stanford University a film series, a food film series, and ongoing programs by all of our various working groups. So keep your eye on our announcements and there's going to be a lot going on here. So now I would like to introduce Robin Reams from the UIC English Department who will introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Sue. Um, so I was pleased to be given the honor to introduce uh, Professor Ralph Cintrone to you today. I've known Dr. Cintrone since before I've known him, uh, <laughs> since he's widely read, highly respected scholar in our field rhetoric. Um, in my view, there are many reasons for the high regard in which Dr. Cintrone and his work are held in our field, and I'd like to give a little overview of those for you as a way of introducing his talk. Um, his work, which is including but not limited to his highly successful book, Angel's Town, um, is widely read by not academic and non-academic audiences alike, and it embodies, in my view, the watchword for our discipline of rhetoric. Um, that is, that rhetoric is concerned with real situations. His work drinks deeply from the academic tradition of rhetoric, um, but it never stops there. Rather, he brings rhetoric into the world and the world to rhetoric. And his extensive ethnographic work, not only in Angelstown, Iowa, but also in Chicago and in the Republic of Kosovo, Dr. Cintron, with great care and sensitivity, provides a rich account of how people use discourse to structure situations that present them with identity hardships, such as poverty, violence, and immigration. Dr. Cintron observes how people deploy discursive structures, or rhetoric, in order to manage their identities within these hardships. The stakes of the exchanges are never isolated to these situations alone, however. Um, Dr. Cintron's analysis impresses me ultimately in that it provides an imp important insight into how these local discursive moments impact political structures like poverty, immigration, and democracy as such. The sensitivity and attentiveness displayed in Dr. Cintron's eth ethnographies would be familiar to anyone who's had the pleasure and the privilege of working with him. He is a careful listener, a patient reader, a generous interlocutor, and a broad thinker. He's known far beyond the walls of the English Department of UIC for his unstinting attentiveness. Um, it's likely for these qualities that he's regularly recruited to give lectures at universities and other institutions nationwide, to lead sessions for our field's premier um, academic society, the Rhetoric Society of America, to serve as editorial board and, and uh, board member and reviewer for the premier journals in our field, including, including Philosophy and Rhetoric, Rhetoric Society Quarterly, and College Composition and Communication. His talk today, entitled Citizenship versus Unauthorized Immigration, Personhood versus President Presence, will, I feel confident to predict, present us with similar qualities that mark the larger body of his work. A careful attunement to the voices of his interlocutors, a thoughtful consideration of the rhetorical structures at work within those voices, and an assiduous development of the larger structural effects of both. Professor Sinto. Thank you so much, Robin, and thank you for coming. Um, I wish I had the time to kind of give you an overview of the larger project. The larger project is titled Democracy is Fetish, uh, and this is one part of it. Um, the notion of citizenship, 
Uh, there's other sections on private property. Then things like transparency with interest me a great deal. But uh, I don't have time to get into that. I do want to make mention that um, this paper and the larger project uh, have three very, has proven to be very difficult to keep all of the moving parts both moving and not moving away from each other. Um, but those three parts are uh, the ethnographic components, uh, largely done up north or a little north of us. Uh, Puerto Rican communities around Humboldt Park, a little bit in the south, Mexican communities, Pilsen, Mavita. Um, obviously, there's the moving part of uh, democracy. One could say that in some ways, uh, trying to do an ethnography of democracy, trying to link up different field sites like, uh, say, Eastern Europe, um, which was opening up at the time I was there, um, opening up to particularly the area of Kosovo, opening up to democracy, opening up to markets, and so on. Uh, the other moving part is rhetoric. Um, and actually, uh, for I have found over time that keeping that moving part, at least in this particular case, separate from this one, is rather important. So this paper is not going to talk very much about rhetoric. I'm going to return to that in, the, in a whole other section, actually which then revisits the very questions of citizenship, but through the lens of rhetoric. And that's the next part uh, that I'm currently uh, writing. But anyway, having said that, I want to move. Uh, this is an enormous thing. I'm going to have to move very fast. Uh, my apologies, uh, but uh, the race is about to start. <laughs> so um, in the United States, naturalization acts and immigration laws have developed a strong distinction between citizens, legal aliens, and unauthorized aliens since the founding of the country. What is striking about reading these acts and laws from 1790 to today is the endurance of certain themes. Indeed, it is almost shocking to find that, despite the great detail that characterizes contemporary immigration laws, the broad parameters are already well in place by 1790. How do we explain this endurance? We could say that these shared themes reveal a foundational structure for imagining the nation state through the lens of the citizen-non-citizen -citizen opposition. What I will be arguing in this paper is that the citizen-non-citizen -citizen opposition distinguishes between those born into versus those who are not. At first glance, that distinction seems relatively banal, of no great significance. However, if those born into more genuinely belong to a specific nation state, then it would seem as if the act of birth, which is nothing less than an act of nature, inserts into our concepts of citizenship, and by extension, the nation state, the idea of the natural. That is, the born into citizen would seem to be the most natural entity for shaping the nation state, the natural grounds upon which to found the nation state. These, at least, are some of the arguments that I want to pursue in this paper. If they hold any weight, then they might go far in explaining why the problems of immigration, and particularly the issue of the unauthorized, raise foundational, and I would say even existential questions for the nation state. And yet we also know that in many instances, these acts and laws are not determined by the idea of the natural. Sometimes they simply reflect the political and economic push and pull of a specific moment in time. That is, immigration acts and laws, as with any rhetoric, are responses to time-bound perceptions of reality and have the specific intention to shape a different sort of reality. This is, Dr. De, or this is De Genova's point when he describes how immigration law primarily produces the very categories of legality and illegality at the behest of what is perceived as national interest. That is, if there is a need for an illegal laboring class, then immigration law and enforcement practices satisfy that need by drafting legislation that tweaks who may or may not enter the country. As a result, the nation historically has swung back and forth between the imperative to securitize versus the imperative to populate open territory 
or secure cheap labor. Under the force of these imperatives, both the citizen and non-citizen become flexible figures, relatively empty in one instance, rhetorically loaded in another. Something similar can be said for the significance or insignificance of our national borders. Although frontiers obviously are etched plainly on a map, their porosity to migrants varies from one perceived historical reality to another. The larger point is that at one point the citizen-non-citizen -citizen opposition raises existential questions for the nation state, while at another moment these questions are trumped by the historical socioeconomic order. So let's briefly consider uh, the Naturalization Acts of 1790, 1795, 1798, and 1802, when the young nation first established the rules for converting aliens into citizens. There are chairs up here. Okay. Uh, the shared themes here are straightforward. Such converts needed to be of the white race, have good character, not be feeble-minded, and be willing to declare loyalty to the Constitution and nation. Uh, aliens also had to be registered beforehand, formally registered, by an official of the state. And there were also residency requirements. Indeed, residency requirements, which will become apparent toward the end of this paper, escalated to 14 years in the summer of 1798 with the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Also appearing forcefully in 1798, is the presidential right to deport enemy aliens. And the reason why, of course, is that the country was headed toward the quasi-war with France. Our own era of amplified monitoring and control, exemplified in things like e-verify practices, is rudimentarily present here as well in the insistence that port authorities, ship captains, and court clerks keep good ledger entries of entering aliens. All in all, I think it can be said that deportation and citizenship function as ancient and therefore constitutive hallmarks of the sovereign right to determine inclusion and exclusion. And this takes me to a larger point. The brand new nation states and democracies did not break this ancient right, but only continue its heritage. And this suggests to me, as I will elaborate soon enough, the difficulty of arguing for more inclusivity in the name of democracy when clearly democracy, like monarchy, is not synonymous with inclusivity. Now there is one new thematic that appears in a pronounced way in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. In addition to the state's traditional interest in preserving what it names the white race, the state now becomes also interested in the migrant economy. The intention of the act was to defend the wages of native laborers, particularly those in white unions that feared cheap Chinese labor. Of course, the underlying sentiments of the act have been simmering for 40 years at least, but the point is that today's use of immigration law to shape local and national economies is already in place by 1882. Compare this to immigration law after September 11, 2001. Today, there is considerable interest on the part of big business, for instance, to quell incipient labor movements. And one of their tools has been immigration policies. Woodfin Suites, for instance, in Emeryville, California, fired hotel workers in 2006 for lacking social, valid social security cards, which had been a non-issue prior to 2005. In 2005, however, the workers, along with city voters, backed a worker protection ordinance and within a year, Woodfin Suites retaliated. Or consider how the American meatpacking lobby has argued for some time about the dangers of the unauthorized migration in order to promote an expanded guest worker program for unskilled foreign labor in order to maximize the industry's control over an otherwise mobile workforce. Um, visa programs uh, offer a considerable advantage to controlling worker from moving around. If you're unauthorized, there's, a, there's much more movement flexibility. The point is that by 1882, the paradigm is very much in place for wielding immigration law in order to shape an economic order. Immigration law then, almost from the beginning, beginning has cut across a host of interests. National sentiment, securitization, foreign relations, economic intervention in the name of labor rights or capitalist accumulation, 
and more recently, resource distribution, states' rights, and electoral districting, among others. Of all these concerns, is one uppermost? I think so. Securitization arguably underpins each concern from 1790 on, as seen in loyalty oaths and in the need to secure whiteness. Indeed, all of the concerns listed earlier may be different manifestations of fear that can only be fully addressed through the attainment of some form of security, that is, the rectifying power, or through the rectifying power of the law. The imperative to securitize, uh, then, is visceral and not easily dismissed, and therefore it has been in place from the beginning. At any rate, this essay will examine how securitization underpins the four key terms in the title of the essay. The first three terms, citizenship, unauthorized immigrants, and personhood, are well established in legal theory, but the fourth term, presence, has little standing. And yet a version of the term is always present or implied in almost every law and Supreme Court decision regarding immigration law in the form of residency requirements or in the acknowledgement that, as Arizona Senate Bill 1070 makes clear, illegals are present among us. Because of the obscurity of the term presence in legal theory, I will offer at most a thought experiment regarding what I will call a politics of presence, a politics that I prefer over today's much more common rights-based politics. Here's a version of rights-based politics. Uh, I hope to return to this and we can talk about it some more. This was during 2006, during the migration uh, rights marches. And this is the one I somewhat prefer. I don't deny the other. The other is simply that. It is, is equally significant for sure. But I prefer this one, and I would like to talk about it later on. And here I think we begin to see a visualization of presence itself, what I'm trying to argue through in this paper. At any rate, if the need to securitize is a kind of governing condition, and if therefore immigration law and the naturalization acts belong to a broader securitization <coughs> regime, then it makes sense that rights-based claims on the part of immigration rights activists continually butt heads against the principle of security. But at a deeper level, securitization tends toward a kind of evisceration of the universal. This then are the stakes of the paper. Securitization is the gravity that pulls down our inclination toward the universal. It territorializes the universal. Explaining further, conceptually citizenship and the nation state are profoundly, though not completely, aligned to securitization, while personhood and democracy are, again, profoundly, though not completely, aligned to the universal. Because these alignments can never be exact, we are left with multiple readings of, among other things, the United States Constitution. So let me conclude this introduction with a rather esoteric sounding assertion that will be explicated at different moments in the paper. Citizenship is the territorialization of personhood in the same way that the nation state is the territorialization of democracy, in the same way that securitization territorializes justice. Meanwhile, the Constitution, as the lawful grounding document of the laws, is the territorialization of both democracy and justice. Uh, the next section here, uh, and I'm going to skip over much of the detail, it's the first ethnographic scene, um, and it concerns a specific moment. Elvira Arellano had taken a sanctuary at a particular church, and um, everyone was, or a lot of people were interviewing her, including some of the people in the room here. And at the time, I was interviewing the, the minister, and the minister had this quotation, which I've extrapolated from the, from the transcript. Um, and I'm going to refer to this uh, quotation. Let me turn to the quotation in order to consider the theme of securitization. The woman that the minister is referring to uh, is Michelle Dalla Croce, the founder of Mothers Against Illegal Aliens. 
For a few years, her views on immigration restriction had some notoriety on Fox News and other venues. Interestingly, during our interview, the minister, a longtime activist, describes her and other immigration restrictionists uh, rather respectfully. He had publicly opposed these figures on different occasions, and I appreciated the magnanimity because I had been interviewing restrictionists at the time myself and had become familiar and genuinely interested, as was the minister, in their arguments and beliefs. So what we're working here uh, with is a quote of a quote, but it represents Dalla Croce well and other restrictionists that I have come to know over the years. So clearly she is trying uh, to secure the country for future Americans here that resemble her, future Americans that resemble her. And she does not say that others not like her or their children may come to resemble her in time. For her, their class and ethnicity seem to be fixed, and it is against their permanency that she wants to secure the nation. Her turn toward the democratic vote, which I think is particularly interesting here, then attempts to legitimize her position. She seems to be looking for some finality that might exist at the heart of democracy, some Trump argument or God term, in this case the idea of the vote that might buttress her opinion. My children won't have the same country, she says, because there'll be all these other people that I didn't vote to let in. Now, in the first quote, uh, De Genova, who's a... Uh, an exceptional uh, theorist of immigration, and his first quotation there, would call the thinking behind this discourse of metaphysics. His term may not apply exactly here, but I think it illuminates what is going on. She is reaching for an ultimate value so thoroughly sanctioned that it can give, convince all of us. She is, she is reaching for an ultimate, uh, excuse me, the appeal of any fetish is how it corrals power and conviction. It is humanly impossible to seize any ultimate power, but we sure can evoke a sense of the ultimate. And that is what she seems to be trying to do with the notion of the vote. Seemingly, the vote here signals a kind of individual ownership over the country, as exemplified in, this is uh, immigration restrictionists and the sign, this is America, get off of my property. So, signals a kind of individual ownership over the country, as if all things occurring in social life ought to be brought to a vote. And once the votes have been cast, then some sort of collective legitimate ownership will have been established. And that's key, the idea of legitimacy. The vote itself is a key mechanism for establishing legitimate rule in a democracy. And so Dalla Croce, by seeing the power, seizing the power of the vote and linking it to her position, is attempting to make her stance regarding the securitization of the country against the unauthorized as legitimate as possible. And her thinking is not eccentric, for the idea of the vote resonates indeed with virtue, with legitimacy, and a certain populist sense that the people do own governance. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. The people are sovereign. Are these not the nostrums that we hear all the time? And alongside this notion of the vote, she could have easily mobilized other populist legitimacies of the anti-immigrant strike that were circulating then. We are a country of laws, or the very catchy, what part of the legal don't you understand? I'm sure that some of you remember those. Uh, these legitimacies are more like resonances, meaning that these conceptions borrow the quality of legitimacy without necessarily being legitimate. But claims don't have to be legitimate in order to have public force. The resonance of legitimacy may be all that they need. Hence, we are not talking here about the institutionalized or correct understandings of democracy. We're talking rather about the resonances of democracy, democracy that seem to circulate nonstop. That is, democracy's associations with such qualities as legitimacy or a populist sense of justice can be deployed to buttress all kinds of claims and policies that may be in direct contradiction with each other. What I want to do next is to turn to a particular Supreme Court case, Plyler versus Doe. If securitization underpins immigration law as much as I have claimed, it should be evident in Supreme Court decisions. In The Citizen and the Alien, 
Linda Bosniak does a painstaking job of summarizing what is at stake in the court decisions addressing alienage. Indeed, when she describes the Constitution's commitment to protecting the rights of aliens as territorially present persons, so she's working with the same language that I am trying to work with, she is, she is speaking friendly words to my ear. And so this allows me to further elaborate on the theme of securitization in immigration law, but also to elaborate on my earlier words, namely, citizenship as the territorialization of personhood. The argument of her book is that the Supreme Court, in a variety of decisions, has declared that non-citizens, such as legal residents and the unauthorized, have a variety of rights, not commonly noticed. But she is also keen to argue that citizens themselves often feel rightless. Her book, then, is a remarkable analysis of how the courts themselves have been a forum for the conceptual struggle over the rights of citizens versus persons. So, let's consider Plyler versus Doe. The case, which was decided in 1982 in a 5-4 to four vote, granted non-citizen children a public education. The case involved the state of Texas, which had claimed that undocumented aliens, because of their immigration status, are not persons within the jurisdiction of the state of Texas, and that they therefore have no right to the equal protection of Texas law. Chief Justice Berger's dissent from the court expanded Texas's claim. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment may indeed apply to aliens after they have entered the country, he said, but it does not mandate identical treatment of different categories of persons. So in Berger's view, what Texas brought to the court was the need to determine whether for purposes of allocating its finite resources, a state has a legitimate reason to differentiate between persons who are lawfully within the state and those who are unlawfully there. Berger, in moments like this, acknowledges the right of Texas to secure its resources against the claims of everyone who may be present in its jurisdiction. Berger goes on. The Equal Protection Clause protects against arbitrary and irrational classifications and against individual individ oh, invidious discrimination stemming from prejudice and hostility. It is not an all-encompassing equalizer designed to eradicate every distinction for which persons are not responsible. In sum, Berger acknowledged the good intent of the 14th Amendment, but worried that the court employs and abuses the 14th Amendment in an effort to become an omnipotent and omniscient problem solver. So this was Berger uh, in the dissent. Justice Brennan, who delivered the opinion of the court, agreed considerably with Chief Justice Berger. For instance, both Berger and Brennan agreed that there is, uh, that did not, that they did, that they, both of them did not, do not think that there is some fundamental right to education. And both believed that the, believed that the unauthorized, including parents and children, are legitimately subject to deportation. In contrast to Berger, however, Justice Brennan emphasized that the state of Texas exaggerated the financial stress due to unauthorized children in its public schools. But his central argument concerned the following. The specter of a permanent caste of undocumented resident aliens functioning as a source of cheap labor, but nevertheless denied the benefits that our society makes available to citizens and lawful residents. So Justice Brennan worried less about the deportation of children and more about the cementing of, the, of a discrete class marked by the stigma of illiteracy, which would disable them from living within the structure of our civic institutions and foreclose any realistic possibility that they will contribute in even the smallest way to the progress of our nation. In sum, Plyler seems to be paradigmatic of Supreme Court decisions when it comes to determining the conditions of life for both legal and unauthorized aliens. 
On the one hand, the courts have granted a certain latitude in terms of alienage rights. Under Plyler, for instance, school children who are unauthorized immigrants can receive state-supported K-12 public education. On the other hand, Plyler also reinforced the vulnerability of aliens by stating that both unauthorized children and their parents can be deported by the federal government. In some, in some instances, the courts have defended some form of securitization, for instance, deportation. But in other instances, inclusion has trumped exclusion. Bosniak, then, writes within the wake of this impasse, for she wants to expand the privileges of aliens based on the 14th Amendment's protection of personhood. Here is section one of the 14th Amendment, which seems to let loose these multiple interpretations appearing in Plyler versus Doe. Take a look particularly at the famous uh, due process clause where we're moving from citizens, uh, nor shall any state deprive any person. So the question always with the 14th Amendment is, with regards to alienage laws, can we give rights to people who are persons and may not be citizens? That is usually where the where everything keeps turning. So that, that's the format, or that's the issue that I want to really begin to address at this point with regards to personhood. What is personhood? Does the 14th Amendment here draw a distinction between citizenship and personhood? For Linda Bosniak, there does seem to be a distinction. This is a, she says, this is a function of the American constitutional system's guarantee of rights to persons rather than citizens a state of affairs that has been forcefully defended by many scholars over the years. For Bosniak and others of like mind, citizenship would seem to be our relationship to the state, whereas personhood would seem to be our relation to some broader, more universal condition. Within this paradigm, the idea of citizenship as a relation to the state does not seem to capture all the dimensionality and breadth of our persons meaning that personhood seems to stand above and beyond our citizenship. Now, the 14th Amendment writers may not have been making such a strong distinction between citizenship and personhood. 14th Amendment, of course, was written after, immediately after the Civil War. After all, the first line of Section 1 territorializes persons by emphasizing their nature as citizens when born or naturalized, naturalized into a jurisdiction. So contrary to Bosniak, one could simply say that Section 1 is pragmatically addressing post-Civil War conditions by casting personhood as a wide net that might protect former slaves from battered and bitter Southerners who, if not accepting the term citizen, might grudgingly accept person for the African Americans in their midst. So is Section 1 an expansive envisioning of personhood? at the expense of citizenship, as Bosniak suggests, or is it a pragmatic maneuver meant to foreclose all the dodges that rebellious white Southerners might cleverly concoct? The stakes today are very real in the sense that, as we have seen, Supreme Court cases can turn on interpretations of personhood. But in a more grounded sense, immigration rights marchers invariably carry signs saying, in effect, we too are persons suggesting that in some fashion, personhood as some sort of universal has become part of the rhetoric of the streets. Still, I am having, I still, I am having uh, trouble getting my head around this understanding of personhood by Bosniak and others. Even if I deeply sympathize with their program of granting more privileges to the unauthorized, which I very clearly and most emphatically do. But here are my problems. Maybe I am wrong to think that securitization underpins the long history of immigration law, and maybe Bosniak is right to think otherwise, namely that personhood has a special standing that, at least in some instances, ought to overcome the imperative to securitize. Clearly, there is something to search out here regarding the logic upon which personhood rests. For instance, does personhood stand above and beyond our relation to the state as Bosniak and others of like mind suggest? Probably not. For at first glance, personhood would seem to be a conceptual artifact 
put into motion from within the legal theories of the state as a counterweight to perceived limitations or reductions inherent in the concept of citizenship. It is as if there is a deep intuition within legal theory that citizenship is not a sufficiently universal condition. Therefore, it must invent the universality of personhood as compensation. Indeed, citizenship can only be parochial, for it must be limited to a specific nation and culture. Hence, legal theory performs a kind of self-correction of this limitation by inventing something more limitless, namely personhood, because it fears the consequences of the law treating us as something less, namely mere citizens or non-citizens. Personhood, then, in this analysis, directly addresses the inadequacies of the law as embodied in the concept of citizenship. The irony, of course, is that the law cannot articulate a genuinely universal condition external to the law. Like citizenship, personhood, too, names a state relation albeit a special kind of state relation, one that tries to transcend the inadequacies of the state itself. Ultimately, perhaps, personhood reveals that neither citizenship nor the entity that citizenship embodies, the state, are sufficiently universal. Both are parochial. But personhood also reveals that there is some underlying imperative on the part of the state to make itself out to be something more fully universal and just. To my mind, what Bosniak and others of like mind have missed is the necessity of personhood as a rhetorical cure to the real insufficiencies of citizenship and the state. Perhaps we can make things clearer uh, by offering an, this is a bit of a joke, by offering an artful summary of four of the voices that we have heard thus far. So let's hear these four voices. Dallacroci, Justice Berger, Bosniak, and Centrone theatrically encounter each other on this artfully constructed stage that exists for your pleasure. How do these four voices encounter each other? Bosniak extends equal rights of personhood to both citizens and non-citizens because for her, this is a natural outcome of liberal democracy's theory of equality. For Bosniak, securitization too often violates personhood. For Centrone, liberal democracy's theory of equality approaches the irrational. Equality, you say? On what planet? This is why he is more interested not in the substantive dimensions of personhood, but in how such a novel idea as personhood gets produced in the first place, how it comes into being. And so he argues that the universalism of personhood is a compensatory move, an invention that attempts to cure and exposes in the process how nation-state citizenship is necessary but inadequate. Mind you, he does not like how securitization trumps personhood, but he understands how securitization acts as an imperative in national consciousness. Now for Dalla Croce and those of like mind. And here, of course, we are artfully putting words into their mouths. These are the uh, citizen restrictionists or immigration restrictionists. Citizenship is the, for her, citizenship is the inter internationally accepted signifier for determining the right to a specific political community. For her, such a political community is not abstract, but more like a gut feeling of belonging, unconsciously shared, while personhood, in contrast, may be an irresponsible construct that ignores the traditional and rightful authority of any nation state to construct its own people. She, more than anyone, embodies the imperative to securitize. For Berger's more finely tuned legal mind, citizenship is a perfectly workable mechanism for determining the political community. And personhood is an important legal theory emerging from the 14th Amendment. His concern has more to do with the potential overuse of personhood as a kind of court-based mechanism for equalizing all kinds of social conditions, including the distinction between citizens and non-citizens. In this sense, Berger and Brennan too, for that matter, 
seem to be trying to negotiate the fine line between the rights of nations and states to control their jurisdictions by excluding some and including others against the rights of personhood, a concept that seems deterritorialized. For Dallacroce and Berger, Bosniak's personhood is simply too expansive, while Centrone's speculations on the production of the law and the inadequacies of citizenship seem to seriously miss the practicality of citizenship as a legal mechanism for stitching the nation to the state. Anyway, I hope you've seen how, through these analyses, citizenship would seem to be the territorialization of personhood. That's what I've been trying to make as an argument thus far. Clearly, we need to go deeper than that, however. We need to enter into the internal logic of citizenship and understand why it is so psychically compelling for someone like Dalla Croce, but for others, such as Justice Berger, it is a simpler thing, something like a useful device that orients both democracy and the nation state. So let's consider Etienne Balabar's We the People of Europe, which makes clear throughout that citizenship is the institution of institutions. That's his claim throughout the book. What does he mean? For him, citizenship is the institution that enables all other institutions. Hence, the officialdom of the nation state, for good or ill, rests on demarcating the citizen from the non-citizen and more deeply the unauthorized. In other words, citizenship founds the political community. And it is then and only then that the political community can, come, can begin to actualize the potential of democracy. That is, prior to determining who and who is not a citizen, democracy remains inert, an ethereal idea full of potential perhaps, but not an official bureaucratized body that can set into motion what it wants to be. In this sense, citizenship marks the beginning of all the practical decisions and existential questions that a body of people must raise. In so doing, democracy ceases to be just an idea. But democracy also ceases to be a species of universalism under this kind of analysis. For now it shrinks to the parochialism of the nation state. It becomes territorialized to the nation state. So that one becomes the citizen of a specific democracy, but not of democracy itself. Hence, at my argument, the nation state territorializes democracy. My point is simple. Citizenship is the first institution, and I'm deriving this from Balavar, because it severs the included from the excluded. Now, the character of any inclusion is to simultaneously exclude. And this is precisely what happens under citizenship. Citizens who are the included have the official capacity to determine the institutions that will protect and govern them. The excluded, unauthorized, are somewhere else. And this is so even if the excluded live in their midst and otherwise fall under the jurisdiction of those same institutions. It is in this sense that citizenship is the institution of institutions that enables the nation state to actualize democracy by limiting the limitlessness of democracy. Still, we have to go further. We have to enter into the two modes by which modern territorialized democracies territorialized by the nation state. Imagine the acquisition of citizenship. In our era, the most common ways of becoming a citizen are natally and through naturalization. We saw these two terms earlier in section one of the 14th Amendment. Through natality, one is born into a community. Through naturalization, one is ritualized into a community. As a point of comparison, legal residents and the unauthorized are merely present in a community, but are not full members of that community. Born into and ritualized into have legal weight, and standing while present in lacks equivalent standing. Born into and ritualized into are devices that enable securitization, 
present in or those present among us, that lacks the markers of born into or ritualized into and thus represent manifold potential threats for those who believe strongly in the need for security. So what is the meaning and importance of birth that cannot be replicated but can be ritualized? What does born into amount to? If we can answer these questions, we will start to understand why citizenship is so psychically compelling for someone like Dalla Croce. Born into is the most privileged condition, the most natural and genuine. Naturalization, certainly a revealing term, tries to imitate the natural or at least compensate for the lack of the natural. Born into presumes that we are so porous to our national people that we somehow absorb them until we become ourselves such a people. But naturalization depends on bureaucratic ritual, the declaration of loyalty, the acquisition of minimal amounts of national language and knowledge to compensate for all that remains missing. Born into is ultimately an archaic concept. And to illuminate it, we might turn to early articulations by someone like, believe it or not, Aristotle who in so much of his work seems to straddle the archaic and modern and thus reveal the longevity of ideas. As is well known, Greece had its own rules of citizenship that depended on natality. And when Aristotle reflects on birth in his politics, he makes the point early on that any person by nature is preceded by the city she is born into. Indeed, the essence of the person is not so much a kind of individual self-realization as it is today, but a self-realization in more communal terms. Um, I'll run quickly through this quotation from Aristotle's uh, Politics. He who is without a city through nature rather than chance is either a mean sort or superior to man. He is without clan, without law, without hearth, like the person reproved by Homer. The city is thus prior by nature to the household and to each of us, for the whole must of necessity be prior to the part that the city is both by nature and prior to each individual then is clear. Accordingly, there is in everyone by nature an impulse at the moment of birth toward this sort of partnership. For a moment, I would like to take up the last term, partnership. And I have the Greek term here, but I have no idea how to pronounce it. Translators of the term have avoided the English word community claiming that it conveys political connotations that the Greek had not acquired. Other possible translations are communion, association. This range of meanings for whatever that term is suggests that the city, and I also have that term and I can't pronounce that, is a type of partnership, community, communion, association, which as a whole must of necessity be prior to the part. That is, prior to any individual. So community precedes us, according to Aristotle, and we find our individualness, purpose, meaning, beingness as we enter into the community. The larger point is that the archaicness of what it, um, no, excuse me, if Aristotle reflected the tenor of his times as the still more ancient world that preceded him, a big if perhaps, the idea of being born into is not about the cultivation of individuality coupled to an economics of self-interest as it is today in the United States, but more about human potential actualizing itself inside kinship, partnership, or political association. Somehow the newborn in all of its porosity gathers over time the character of her community, takes it in until he becomes a version of it, and this simultaneously is her self-actualization. The community transforms raw nature into human nature. To not undergo that transformative power is to be inhuman. That is, as Aristotle says it, a wild animal or a god. In this sense, born into enables not a mimetic reproduction of the community, but certainly its continuation, which over time might solidify its difference, its exceptionalism. So what I'm suggesting here is born into's archaic expression, but also its modern expression in birthright citizenship. It is perhaps unfair to both Aristotle and Johann Fichte, the German philosopher, to compare 350 BCE to 1808. 
But Fichte, in his addresses to the German nation, adds a love of nation and religion to Aristotle's sense of communal partnership. I would juxtapose them because beneath both texts there seems to be an enduring sensibility, namely that the self cannot find its beingness except within the community structures that one is born into. Um, and then just a quick quotation from uh, Fichte, uh, addresses to the German nation. This is his love for his people. At first he respects, trusts, rejoices in it, takes pride in his descent from it. The divine has appeared in the people, and so he is active, effective, sacrificing himself on behalf of his people. Permanence is promised to him only by the independent perpetuation of his nation. To save it, he must be willing even to die so that it may live and he live in it the only life he has ever wanted. This archaic view, um, which remains strongly buried inside concepts of citizenship and nationalism, needs one more element to be fully understood, and that's the notion of place, demarcated patch of land. People make claims on the planet either through rigidly determined borders, as with nation states, or softly determined ones, as in earlier times. The point is that groups tend to essentialize themselves that is, make themselves visible to themselves and others by pointing to their cultural difference as well as their geographies. The modern passport and birth documents marking today's bordering of the earth represent the astonishingly ancient sensibility of fusing a people to a specific geography. The extent to which a border can keep a people stationary, and increasingly they no longer can, it enables the fixing of difference. In sum, one cannot be born into a community without being born into a place, and this has led to all kinds of possessive sensibilities, such things as mythologies of land and community that become homelands, sacred lands, heartlands, and if you want any place in the world to witness that, go to Eastern Europe, go to Serbia, and go to Kosovo. The psychic stuff of community leaks out into specific landforms and fuses them to the community's ultimate values. But all this cannot happen under conditions of too much mobility. Hence, we have seen the rise of a politics of mobility uh, resistant uh, to borders. This brings me to a major point. Citizenship in the forms of born into and ritualized into reveals not just the nation state's ancient sensibility, but also bridges toward Balabar's provocative notion that citizenship is the institution of institutions for any democracy. What better emblem then of the melding of the nation state to democracy than the common term that they share, citizenship? As I suggested early in the essay, we do not live in democracy. We live in some nation state or territorialized version of democracy. My exact words were these. Citizenship is the territorialization of personhood in the same way that the nation state is the territorialization of democracy. What I want to do is to jump into the next section. Um, because what I want to raise now, finally, is what is this politics of presence that I've been talking about? And I think we'll leave it at that. Um, I have other ethnographic scenes, but I don't think I have time to really go through those ethnographic scenes in which we have a kind of like a, a wild version of politics of presence. There's also a considerable amount of material that I have on the Dominican Republic and its recent um, well, 2004, 2010, the writing of the Constitution in the Dominican Republic, and then in recent legal decisions in 2013, in which the Haitians, uh, who are multiple generations of Haitians born into the Dominican Republic, are being increasingly determined as perpetually in transit. In other words, they were born, they are present, but now they're being legally determined as in transit. In other words, their citizenship is being pulled away from them. And so court cases have been taken up to the 
uh, international human rights courts uh, trying to declare that they have that they too have a right to nationality. So these questions of presence, etc., and questions of in transit mobility and how they keep flowing through the law, whether it's immigration law in the United States or the uh, international courts on human rights and so on. But what I want to do is to uh, finally give you a conceptualization of presence, which I do think is different. So let me end the paper on uh, these last sections here. What if we became more modern than we are? In other words, no longer archaic in our born into, ritualized into. Since the democratic revolutions, we have been defining the future as increases in all sorts of mobility and urging a general increase of freedom. In this sense, the modern has been defined by a politics of mobility in opposition to forces that seek different forms of the stationary. In our era, the nation state is one form of the stationary. Citizenship with its modes of birthright and naturalization is another. In an earlier era, however, both the nation state and citizenship were imagined as advancements in mobility and freedom. Securitization has always been the defense of the stationary. But what if we became more modern than we are? I would like to describe and theorize presence as a certain brute condition regarding the unauthorized. If we think of citizen and citizenship as referencing habitation in its old sense, habitation in a city, and further the rights and privileges of a free man as an inhabitant of a city, then we see its ancient dialectical pairing to present in those who are present among us. In other words, present in has been there all along. The condition that the sovereign must trump through the conditions of born into and ritualized into, or decides to eradicate through banishment, exile, deportation, or roundups. The first act of governmentality starts here, and so the birth certificate that notes the first minute of life of those born into makes utter sense as the persistence of the archaic in modern times. Presence then, in contrast to personhood, refers to another archaic condition that has always faced sovereignty. Today it is a brute condition, a kind of implacability, that the democratic imaginary must address. And this indeed is precisely what Supreme Court decisions on immigration have attempted to do. I would like to describe this bruteness as a type of pre-political condition that democracy must draw into itself, must absorb and transform, if it is to maintain its integrity and self-understanding. It is the facticity of the unauthorized, their bodies, then, that faces the democratic imaginary and asks, essentially, if democratic justice, which presumes a kind of global universal equality, can bear to be territorialized. Of course, justice is always territorialized, but even this fact is not sufficient to erase the force of the universal that is embedded in and acts upon human conceptions of justice. No matter how pragmatic and necessary our territorialization of justice, its residual universality continues to call so there is always this strain between justice as territorialized and justice as universal, a strain that cannot be erased. It is in these senses, then, that the facticity and the implacability of the unauthorized faces democratic justice fully trapped inside that contradiction. Implacability understands the following truth. Democracy is the political order that invents the very idea of the political. For politics prior to democracy is essentially war among elites. Democracy changes that condition by introducing into this war a new population, which over time expands horizontally. 
these new populations and all further expansions prior to their incorporation represented in their day a pre-political condition. In some, democracy is identifiable with the transformation of pre-political conditions into the political, into expanding the franchise. That is its signature, its historical and ontological character. This is what gives democracy its forward motion, its relentless invention of the future, the idea of a better future for all. For instance, the 14th Amendment discussed earlier was part of this forward motion and continues to do so even as Justice Berger tried to slow its movement by refusing to impulse, by refusing its impulse to equalize everything. This is why the pre-political always sits in front of democracy with a kind of vast implacability. As presence, it is weightier than personhood and weightier than agency. Presence can sit in stillness and never act, for the facticity of its pre-political condition is both democracy's creation as well as the brute material upon which it must act. If it, if it refuses to pull the pre-political into the political, then frankly we exist in another political order. Democracy's self-definition, self-understanding, self-everything cannot do otherwise. And this is why the presence of an unauthorized, in all their pre-political condition, itself democracy's creation, can sit in front of democracy as implacable force. Well, I'm going to end it here. Um, like I said, the, the next section of the paper really does raise questions when it doesn't seem to be so implacable after all. And I think the, the perfect example of thinking about that literally is the Dominican Republic um, and its case with the Haitians. And ultimately, in that case, which is brought up um, to, the, uh, to the court, the International Court on Human Rights, a very interesting conclusion is made. And what I derive from that argument is the following. That when one looks at the foundation of residency requirements all the way from the beginning, from 1790 on, doesn't make any difference. Uh, residency requirements are always in immigration law, in virtually every nation, as, as far as I can tell. You always have to be there for two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. The recent laws that they're trying to push these days in the United States is 14 years. But anyway, the point is that residency requirements is a form of presence. And when you examine residency requirements, there is no essential difference between legal residency and illegal residency. And that seems to be the crux of the matter. In other words, residency seems to say, residency seems to make this important claim that somehow or another you must be among us, you must absorb us in some fashion or another. But there is no qualitative difference. There is no substantive difference between legal residency and illegal residency. They both accomplish that. So the question then becomes, and I think rightfully so, in this, uh, with that, um, with that, in that court case with the uh, International Human Rights course, uh, Courts, there was that statement that was made. So what is the significant difference between legal residency and um, the other thing about illegal residency? If the whole notion of residency accomplishes what you hope it to accomplish. In other words, to repeat the born into, but you, it's a simulacra of born into, it's not the exact born into. Anyway, it's on those sorts of things that I think you begin to see that the possibility of presence is already a workable, theoretical, viable um, issue that's already built into immigration law. And it seems to me that over time, that, those sets of arguments are going to be carrying more and more weight. And so I think there is a possibility that as we see uh, immigration law evolve over the, over the next, say, 100 years or so, we will see increasingly a kind of acknowledgement of presence and that, that, and that we have to acknowledge it in some fashion or another. Anyway, that basically is the talk. I, I you know, apologize. Uh, I have to apologize because I can't get through all of the elements of the argument, but I tried to get into as many of them as possible. So there are other elements that are out there, and perhaps we can discuss them uh, as part of question and answer.
Um, Elizabeth Cohen makes an argument that uh, what is important is time. Yes. She pursues a liberal right. perspective on this right. and essentially says that time, which is a measure of presence, yes. is uh, what really is the foundational right. notion here. Uh, and that even in the case of the Antenati, which are the people who collaborated with the British during the Revolutionary yeah. War, their presence post-Civil War in the country um, basically uh, cons constitutes consent, consent of the government uh, for their presence. So um, I'm, I'm curious to know why you're rejecting a, a li the liberal tradition solutions to the problems of... Uh, Is your understanding the liberal solution to the problem rights? Uh, yes. Right. Yes, essentially. Right. Yes. Yeah, let's, um, let's go back. i use that as an excuse to go back to that... Uh, here's a rights claim. And I'll try to translate this a little bit. This is legalization now. We are here, aquí estamos. Y no nos vamos. In other words, we're not going. Y si nos echan, if you throw us out, nos regresamos. Uh, we'll come back. So, contrast that uh, to this one. We demand equal labor rights, the, obviously the, the Statue of Liberty there, and so on. I'm not against this. I'm not rejecting it at all. And in fact, I would make a, a more subtle argument that even if you're arguing for presence, more than likely, given the current discourse, presence is going to be articulated through rights anyway. So, as it is uh, in, the, in the decision with um, the Dominican Republic, uh, the, 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 the Court on Human Rights eventually says, well, there is a right to nationality. They don't argue on the grounds of presence. They, they argue on the rights of nationality. So I think the question that you're asking is, what, what might be my problem with rights? And I'll give you my answer. And I'm not going to expect anybody to agree with me, all right? Because I will, I, I will admit it's a bit of a, maybe it's a bit esoteric, maybe it's a little kooky or, you know, or something or another. My problem with rights discourses is that it keeps privileging what I'm calling the atomization of the world. And by the atomization of the world, I'm thinking of private property rights. So we atomize private property. We give it, we survey it, we bound it, and so on. We atomize nation states so that we have the rights of the nation. There is an atomization in here in Arizona versus United States, Justice Scalia, and how he frames Arizona. And he essentially says, Arizona is a sovereign state, and they have a right to determine who comes in and who doesn't. So he is thinking of states' rights. That, to me, is another form of singularity. So through all these forms of singularity, my argument, and I'm trying to do this in the larger text, the democracy is fetish, that, that democratic politics is essentially, uh, through rights discourse, is essentially a discourses of violence. In other words, in our singularities, we are contesting each other to the point of violence. So what do we have? Right to uh, arm ourselves and defend ourselves as just one kind of extreme example. So rights discourses to me are this can of worms that simply opens up into the potential atomization of all of the peoples to individuals against each other, but I mean, it's kind of like a, a Hobbesian world in some fashion or another. Individuals against each other, or groups against each other. And then, then democratic politics then becomes a kind of uh, a way, how do you manage these violences which are being, um, which are being further grounded in, in large, almost transcendental theories of, I have a right. So I'm trying to find some other way out of this in some fashion or another. But you're using the discourse of citizenship, and it seems to be that even citizenship, it has a portion of it that's collective, but a yeah. lot of it is right. about the individual membership. Yes, it is. So you're basically 
kind of torpedoing your grander collect like our, our, our universalist our, notion by using the term of citizen. Are are you thinking that I am I am defending citizenship? It, it, I'm not sure what you're doing because I wasn't it wasn't oh. clear to me. No, not at all. Uh, how you're using it? Citizenship is the territorialization of personhood. For me. But at some point you mentioned specifically, and I have in my notes, right. that citizenship is necessary. No. And I'm trying to go beyond citizenship. Uh, for me, my problems with citizenship are precisely all of those notions of born into and ritualized into. Now, I think you're right about this. Do I see a practical advantage to citizenship? Well, of course I do. And this is what always occur in all the Supreme Court cases, right? Whether it's Berger or Brennan. And I think we have to acknowledge the kind of the practical utility. If you're going to have nation states, then are, are you, you're probably going to have a me mechanism such as citizenship. That doesn't mean that I defend it. And it doesn't mean that I defend nation states either. But I certainly acknowledge the practical utility of those mechanisms. So then you and I don't see any specific way around that. So you would, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. You wouldn't go as far as like Jackie Stevens. Oh, I would go almost as far as she would, yes. I mean, she wants to abolish birthright citizenship. But it's interesting, Jacqueline Stevens, as I understand her, is still, curiously enough, defending citizenship. Citizenship as a membership yes. at the state level, not as a yes. group membership. I think her arguments are really completely fascinating. Uh, but I think she is absolutely right about trying to abolish birthright citizenship. I think she's right on in terms of that, I, and, I, and I would have to agree with her. I would like to go even, well, I don't want to say a little further, because I, you know, I don't know how you go much further than Jacqueline Stevens. But um, there, is a, there is a temptation in my mind, uh, how can we step beyond citizenship? Because I think it's an impossible category. Uh, so my defense of it is strictly at the level of I understand its practical utility in a kind of contemporary setting in which we have no other set of alternatives. But I think it also mobilizes all of the sorts of negative things which I think we ought to be opposing. And I have the same feeling about rights as well. Rights are a kind of the world that we live in. Um, I would defend them to... I would defend, you know, that other sign, for instance. But I see its limitations, and I would like to project beyond it. Yeah, I have a really basic question about the word presence. Yeah. And you talked about the physics and the metaphysics of citizenship. My understanding... Uh, that was... Um, yes, well, yes, I did probably do that. I mean, I'm, I'm working with uh, Dejanova's language. He talks about the physics and metaphysics of borders. That's how he frames it. why the Aristotle is so central? Because for him, the, there is the physics and the metaphysics are connected. You're physically born somewhere, yeah. and then this metaphysical thing happens to the self. Yeah. My really basic question is, is presence what you call the group condition? Is that the natural or the fusis that underlies personhood and citizenship as a metaphysics? I don't know. Um, I, think, I think where you and I would agree, I, I don't exactly know how to answer that question, I, where you and I would agree, um, and this is where it kind of spills over a little bit into rhetorical theory, what is this notion of presence? And it comes from, as, as, as you and I know, because we've been working on it together, you know, all of that stuff of Heidegger reading Aristotle and so on and so on. I think there's a hell of a lot there to think about for rhetorical theory. And it's not in this chunk. It's in the next uh, I'm kind of juxtaposing a rhetorical chapter against a social theory chapter, so to speak. So this is a big social theory chapter, and I wanted to lay out all of the intertwining things about citizenship, immigration, unauthorized immigration, personhood, presence, because I think those are so complex that they need like their entire kind of development. In the next chapter, I'm returning to citizenship but through a rhetorical lens. And that's where the idea of presence now gets picked up through these understandings of Heidegger, uh, Agamben, and so on, which seems to me, I didn't want to mix all of this up together, right? 
So, so now that's a very different kind of project. Now it's thinking about language and it's thinking about presence as a, as a kind of like a force, as a kind of movement through language. And the notion of movement through language is also interesting to me because it becomes connected here to the politics of movement and so on. All right, so, you know, inside my head anyway, there is this corner over here which is rhetorical, this corner over here which is of social theory. Now, beyond that, I don't know that I can really say, uh, you know, it, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think you know, kind of like because of our conversations, you know where, where that other part might be headed. I guess then I would just say here, it feels like, in this context, presence is the closest thing to the natural. It's uh -huh. like the, the literalness of bodies yeah. and their scale and force. Yeah, that notion of implacability. Um, I have to admit, that, that kind of, I find that compelling as a something, you know. Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, I have a question that's very closely related to that, I guess, yeah. and it's um, when you were speak. of course, since you're speaking about the 18th century, you know, that's like my swimming pool, and yeah. um, I, it just struck me that there were some aspects of what you were saying that did connect with some natural rights theory yeah. uh, during mm -hmm. the 18th century that was so highly critical of the construction of the nation state. Mm -hmm. And you get some aspects of that echoing in Hannah Arendt yeah. um, in the origins of yes. totalitarianism in You're a right. critical vantage point. And so I was just wondering like, to what extent the, the, the notion of presence might, you know, not that you would necessarily want to go in the direction of natural law or natural rights, but right. like what would the connection be, especially since that tradition is very, very, it can be very critical, like from the 17th century with Grotius um, onward. Well, I think, you know, my first reply, Mark, is that I, I, I really kind of presume that you know much more about that than I do, uh, you know, and I would love to talk to you some more, you know, particularly if you have some insights about, you know, uh, of where to go with it. I have to admit, um, you know, the whole problem of history has been just perplexing me, you know, within the, within, not only in this, in this text, but it's been perplexing me within the larger text, mostly because I want to work ethnographically, and yet all of this ethnographic stuff, when someone says, I have a right, I'm doing field work up north, you know, up, up around Humboldt Park, uh, Elvira Arellano says, I have a right, you know, to be here. All of that, you know, the, 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 the entire residue of that entire system just seems to spill over in some fashion or another. And that's why, that's why, that, that's one of the things that's made the, the project complicated. Because ethnographically, when you hit these nodes of democratic talk, like rights, equality, justice, social justice, and so on, they seem to be loaded with this entire history in some fashion. And so unpacking that entire history and, and seeing how it flows through everyday language has not been, has not been easy, you know, to tell you the truth. And so, uh, you know, I, can, I understand, I think, really, really well. I wish I could read to you the final ethnographic scene in which this kind of crazy version of presence begins to leak out uh, with Latin America as the underbelly of the United States and so on. But... It, 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 has, it has proven to be difficult, balancing the ethnographic elements which seem to be loaded with so much historical discourse. Anyway, I would like to know as much as, as I could about the historical discourse, but there are limits in terms of managing the entire project. Um, so, some states distinguish their citizens into subclasses. Yes. Like the state of Israel, for example. Yes. The right. Supreme Court of Israel, I don't know if you've heard right. about this, mm -hmm. said residents cannot identify themselves as Israelis. Right. In the national registry, because yeah. that move could have far reaching consequences for yes. the country's Jewish character. This yes. is a translation from uh, the Supreme Court opinion or something. So instead, residents are required by law to identify themselves as Jews, yes. Arabs, yes. Druze, and so on. Yes. What does that imply about yes. your view? That is, um, th thank you so much for that, for that example, because that's precisely the problem that I'm trying to get at. And again, 
the other section of the paper, which I did not read, actually is even more clear than that. Or it's, it's along the same lines. And it's the relationship of the Haitians to the Dominicans. So to, just to give you quickly what that's about is you have multiple generations of Haitians born in the Dominican Republic. We're not talking about uh, migrants uh, coming for a few years and then suddenly the government becomes aware of them like they do here, so let's say, in the, in the United States. We're talking about generations, multiple grandfathers, parents, and children. All right? So the question for the Dominican Republic has been, uh, for a variety of reasons, has been looking upon this population. And then, within the 2000s, they begin to make the decision, we don't want them here. They are permanent in transit. Now, maybe you know that in transit category, again, is one of the international categories, right? So, um, if I am in transit, I am not a citizen. If I give birth to someone as in transit, I am not a citizen. Typically, there are 10 days that you have of in transit, right? So, what the Dominican Republic has been trying to do is to expand the conception of 10 days of in transit to... Three generations. That's impossible. And the, the court of the human rights court caught them on that. You have no determinable limit, they said, on what the category of in transit is. You cannot do this. And then the Dominican Republic replied, We're sovereign. You can't tell us what to do. The notion of states' rights, in other words. It's securitization. So now that smacks them in the face, right? So now the question is that there are instances precisely like this in which residency, no one gives a shit. The Dominican Republic and Israel do not care. So the question of how long are you here in time and the implacability of time and all of its, all of its what, ontological qualities, over time I become like you in some fashion or another. All of a sudden, it becomes a denial of that. So it doesn't seem so damned implacable. And that becomes the problem. So, so my argument then becomes, look, democracy doesn't always work in the sorts of advancing ways that we would like to think, in which a pre-political condition, whatever that group might be, democracy by its self-definition must bend towards that community to include it. Well, the Dominican Republic hasn't and doesn't look like it's going to anytime soon, and not even the court can say that. Israel hasn't, and then that's why we don't, no longer even think of Israel as a democratic country. We think of it as a theocracy of some sort or another, not really a democracy. So that, these are precisely the examples. So the question, and, and I have no solution, but the question becomes, well, how long can states like this hang on to this, to this vision in which residency or the presence doesn't, doesn't count? At some point, does the democracy just kind of like say, well, you can't do it? Or court decision, does the international order become strong enough in some fashion that it can actually have some force in these sorts of cases? Yeah, I don't know. And none of us know, of course. But those become the problems. Israel and the Dominican Republic. Yeah, Rob? Um, yeah, I, I got an observation and a question. And a question kind of follows Mark's question a little bit. But one observation was, um, your quote-unquote from the mothers against illegal aliens. Yeah. Um, I, it just occurred to me as, as you were reading that to us that you, you suggested that she accords this discourse of absolutes to the word vote as a sort of... Yes, I think she does. As a sort of um, a term that stands in place of all democracy. But it, also, I noticed that she also invokes the discourse of birth as well. She's yes, talking she does. about her children yes. and um, her children and the world that she's born them into yeah. and, and what kind of world they should be right. entitled to encounter by virtue of their birth, yes. um, which I don't know, given everything else you said about birth seems significant to me. Um, and especially because the way that she talks about the um, immigrant or the alien yes. is in stark contrast to the um, Estamos aquí or aquí estamos poster, yes. she's, right. because she talks about them as not yet there, not being yes. there, right? yes. not yet and present. Even if they were born there, she yeah, would yeah. still say the same thing. Um, but so that 
was just an observation, but my question is, it seems to me that you're, you're dealing with different notions of birth or different ways of thinking about birth or talking about birth um, that make me think that maybe you don't necessarily want to dispense with birth. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's all stop being born. <laughs> of being born into a place, yes. being born into a, a kind of physical space that has an idea of nationhood around it. But then, as, as um, Mark just brought up, in modernity and in the 18th century, um, birth becomes inflected with birth rights, the rights of man, natural rights. Right. Um, and, so then, and then we have that kind of laid over a, an ancient model of democratic citizenship, where yes. citizenship is not for sale. Citizenship doesn't come through paying dues or, and indemnities and being born into a family. That would be like the third, like the Greek version, um, mm -hmm. the third version of, of being born into a family, which is precisely what Aristotle's arguing against because that version of birth poses such a threat to democracy. Because being born into an oligarchic, um, yes. aristocratic family right. means that that family asserts their rights as an individual family over the common. So by arguing for understanding birth as being born into a, a commonly shared place, which yes. I'm, I'm imagining that those those terms you were wondering about were either one of term, two terms, either point or zoom on. That would be yeah. my guess. But, I'm sure that you can pronounce um, it. The, so those terms, those terms, and those terms are translated in like a, a million ways, but right. I mean, they're translated to mean something that's shared, like a language, something that belongs to all of us. They're translated to mean, um, to mean, uh, like, you have something universal. Um, they're also translated to mean, to, to differentiate what's commonly shared among people as opposed to what the elite is. And so, or what's, what's accessible just only for the elite. And so it seems to me that maybe, and I just naturally links up in my mind with what I know other, other things you're working on having to do with the commons. And so I'm wondering if maybe this idea of not, not, a, not birth as natural rights, not birth into a family, not birth into a place, but birth into, into sharedness or birth into the commons is something you're for. Well, certainly something like that would appeal to me. Um, I don't know. Into a commons which cannot be simply identifiable as community or simply identifiable as, as family. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. But as a kind of like some, a broader commons. Yeah, some redefinition mm -hmm. of the commons and an attachment of that redefinition of what's common to birth. Yes, I find that very appealing. I, I do find that appealing. Uh, again, um, because it, uh, for me at least, because it be begins to break up that, that singularity of stuff that we get through the notion of family, Jackie, Jackie Stevens and her, her problems with the conception of family, I share that. Uh, breaking up the notion of community, or, or not breaking it, that's too strong a word, but kind of trying to suggest some other kind of patterning for for that notion of being born into. That isn't atomizing. Yeah, that isn't atomizing, precisely. You know, I, you know, you are more sophisticated in, in these matters of reading the Greek than I am, and I would like to talk to you some more about that, you know, interpretation within, uh, you know, within Aristotle, so maybe we can have more conversation about that. Yeah, I was um, going back to the policy that I said we always talk about. I mean, when my question would be, why can't there be, I think in, 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 in reality, in effect, like for yeah. example in the state of Illinois, yes. there is an existence of person, coexistence of personhood and, and residence. For yeah. example, okay. um, I think personhood is more used in cases where there's, there's an attempt to be protected from something. So for example, when um, Cook County President uh, Tony Parkigal says, okay, you can't treat people who are detained differently. Mm -hmm. No matter what their citizenship, they have to be released within a certain time. Even if Immigration and Customs Enforcement is telling us not to, we're not, we're not going to listen to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Mm -hmm. We're going to create this ordinance where we don't listen to them. And I see that as a notion of personhood because there's no consideration for how long people have been here. Uh -huh. That could have been an immigrant who was here, you know, a month, who got here a month ago. It's irrelevant. For her, it's about sort of a, some kind of equality of right that I think is based on the notion of personhood. Right. Versus things like tuition waiver, uh, tuition, 
and in-state tuition for yeah. undocumented students or the driver's license, the recent driver's license. I think those are much more based on sort of a notion of residence and have some requirements of having been some time in Illinois. Yeah. So, so I, I'm not, I, well, I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, and, and those I connect more with social rights kind of things. Right. You know, although we could question what, what those are. But, but I'm, so I'm trying to ask is why does it have to be one or the other? Yeah. Uh, and there's another part of the paper where I simply admit that, um, first of all, for a kind of practical politics, that separation between, you know, as I had it in the title, you know, personhood presence, um, doesn't make any sense. Because uh, in, in any kind of practical politics, you, as you know, you're going to grab whatever argument is going to work for you. So if you're arguing for residency, as you know, if you're if you're if you're arguing on the basis of residency, you're probably going to claim some sort of rights or personhood or something or another, in order to kind of verify that. Or as I said in the case of the Dominican Republic, that notion of right of nationality is what is, is becomes the language. So there they're using rights talk as well. Of course, that's the International Court of Human Rights. So they're going to do that. But anyway, so that notion of separating personhood from uh, from uh, presence uh, or from residency is not going to play itself out in real arguments that occur in courts or even more so in the imaginaries of marchers as they're walking along protesting this or that or what have you. I, you know, so I'm not going to deny that. Um, I, I think that ultimately they, they have to, out of practical grounds, they have to keep intersecting each other. And actually, I would like to offer that as what the paper really is about. Uh, the very last sentence on this paper says, my paper, or this paper, does not hang on presence as a, as a defensible kind of argument. The paper hangs on the intersection of these sorts of terms. Nevertheless, as you know, and as you and I have talked a lot about, I just have this damn obstinate um, argument, uh, you know, with regards to rights, because I just feel its atomization of the world. So I think when I run into a counter-argument like yours, my point, uh, my, my only reply becomes something like the following. Amalia, don't you also see the problem of rights? <laughs> right? So if you were here giving your lecture, I would say, Amalia. <laughs> and you would probably say, yes, uh, you know, there is a kind of a politics of violence or whatever it is that we want to call it. There is a kind of a politics of violence uh, which emerges from rights um, and that the democratic imaginary or the democratic politics becomes a kind of a management of these violences in some sort of way. So if that has some footing, and I think it does, then you can see why I would be trying to argue for this counter thing, presence. Do I see the problems with presence? I certainly do. Um, do I see the impracticality of presence divorced from personhood? I certainly do. I think it is still, there is something significant, I think, and maybe I haven't done it as well as I would like, but I think there is something significant about trying to articulate the counter to rights, or counter to personhood, and to say, look, here is this thing here. Let's see how far we can go with it, and let's see, you know, if we can do it, if we can kind of theorize it and develop it in some fashion. My point, I think, you know, in that sense, is you know, it's kind of simple. It acknowledges your point position, but it says there's still something worthwhile in doing this. Maybe one more, one last. Um, the kind of the notion of presence, of, you know, pride or interested in kind of rendering it through the lens of phenomenology. And I ask because yes. because this idea, notion of born into um, not as a mimetic reproduction but an absorption, right? Yeah. Or you mentioned visceral over and over again, which to me is sort of the experience of violence. Yeah. I feel all that's embodied, right? And it's attuned in that kind of way, and, yeah. and particularly because your project is also ethnographic. Yeah. There's a lot of people sort of using that lens to to yeah. that render that intersection, right? Yeah. Embodiment, um, using the idea of presence, but yeah. talking about it like, um, yes. ethnographically via phenomenology. I think Joan Gross, volatile body, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, well, there are some philosophers in the room. Uh, we know, for instance, that in philosophy, 
Husserl articulates through phenomenology something about presence. Heidegger, through phenomenology, articulates something about presence. So we know that it has some sort of phenomenological sorts of things. I'm not a philosopher. I can't tell you exactly what phenomenology is. I remember reading Husserl uh, about five pages when I was 16 years old. Don't ask me why the hell I tried to pick that thing up, you know, and to read it. But that was my first encounter. Uh, you know, in Elvai, yeah. what the hell was I trying to do with, you know, where did the five fine hustle, you know, in, in the sticks, you know, of South Texas? I don't know. But I had it there, and I tried to read it, and I tried to understand it, and it didn't make any sense to me. But now it makes a little more sense. So yes, um, and also I might add, there's an anthropologist, I can't think of his name right now, but it works uh, through phenomenology, it won the Victor Turner Prize. Uh, the same year I did, actually. And so that's why I got to know him. And, and I was fascinated by his work, and he called it a phenomenology of whatever, you know, X, Y, Z. So obviously there must be some sort of connection here that appeals to me, which I haven't, you know, gotten into because it just takes me down this philosophical path, which I would just as soon stray, stay away from. But, but nevertheless, yes, you're right. There, there's some sort of underpinning here which philosophers have called phenomenology. Yeah, and I just sort of, the rendering of, of the term, but how to translate that epigraphically, which I think yeah. people are doing more, not just yeah. the form, but yeah. how do we sort yeah. of apply this in terms of cultural theory or everyday life. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like I said, that, that the, the anthropologist that I'm thinking of, again, whatever his name is, uh, uh, was working anthropologically, uh, or working through anthropology phenomenologically. Yeah, a lot of people sort of not taking that right. recently. Yeah. Sure. Well, can we continue this informally at a reception outside and thank Ralph? <laughs> now can I run away? <laughs>